<laughs> Jughead. Oh, hey, what's up, guys? Hey, it's Jeffrey Booster here, and I'm uh, I'm the host of this uh, this here show, Day for Night, where we talk to mostly musicians about movies. Um, this week, my special guest is a drummer um, from the Sadies. He's played with Nico Case and Neil Young. He's played with all kinds of cool people, but if even if he's never played with anybody, he's a great dude. And um, but yeah, he's had a good career. He's a great dude. And yeah, we're gonna talk about some movies, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Bolitsky. Hey, Mike. Hey, Jeffrey. How's it going? It's good. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on the show and talking about movies with me. It's all I really know how to talk about, you know, that Jughead comics. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. I, I had a cousin who had, had all those Archie comic digests and like I'd spend, you know, go visit him in the summer and spend most of my time just reading Archie digests. So <laughs> if you want to oh, dish, you want to dish about Archie and Moose and Reggie and <laughs> yeah. all those dudes. And yeah, that's great. <laughs> Because I, I don't yeah. really know anything about movies. I, I, I can just talk about Archie. All that's my, my yeah, we'll thing. do an Archie one next time. <laughs> um, I've read Archie since I was 16, about 15 or 16. I think I started out reading them like ironically. I thought that would be like my thing. Uh -huh. And then I still get them, in, I still get them in the mail like 20 some years later. Really? Um, that's yeah, I, I have a <laughs> subscription. I don't like that show, that Riverdale show. It's like all it's all serious and sexy. I, I, and, yeah, I, I I didn't even give it the time of day. I can't. No. I can't. Archie will always be, you know, print in print for me. Yeah. Um. So I was thinking you before you came on, if yeah, if you remembered how we do you remember how we met? Uh, we it was in it was at the Earl, I believe, right? Like, and your band so. was playing with my band, I think, right? No, I don't. I think it's before I had a band. Um, I, I didn't. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot. I can remember. I think the first time I met you, I was probably like nineteen or twenty, and I don't think I had an active band. I think I just had that CDR that I probably gave you that I used to give out oh, to everybody of like yeah. toy piano music, and you were like super nice and put up and actually talked to me because I'd be like everybody that rolled through town that I was like a big fan of, um, like it was like you know like whoever um but you guys were like a like a like a big one for me because it's back in the day this is so long ago the way i heard of you guys was in the back of like nme or one of those like cool music magazines and it was like spaghetti western it, anything with the word spaghetti western in it would get my full attention uh -huh. and uh, the first time i saw you guys you opened with empty the chamber so i i'd never heard a note of your music it's back before you could like look it up you know I just read that, and you guys opened with Empty the Chamber, so like I fell in yeah. love with you guys like right away. But yeah, you were super cool. I'm joking around, but you were like super cool. And we talked, we talked for a while. Uh huh. Yeah, I, I definitely remember. I remember that. I I I used to love opening the set with Empty the Chamber. I thought that was a real, a real uh, way to like come come out like gangbusters. But yeah, yeah we haven't Are done that in years. But yeah, that that was <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. How much is your um? <laughs> How much of your sets are like instrumental now that you guys, cause like it used to be a lot of instrumentals, but it I haven't did, seen you yeah, guys in that, so long. That definitely started to, um, to diminish over the years. Um, but there's still, there's still some that we'll throw in there from, from time to time. But uh, yeah, it was starting to, it was starting to take a bit of a, not that it was any less important. Like we still enjoyed, composing those instrumentals on our records but they were fewer and farther between a little more maybe they were a little more like to make up for that they were a little more grand i remember um i asked i think it was travis i asked um if you guys were like really all into spaghetti western movies because like obviously a lot of those early records had a lot of that like uh was a cloud eater and um i think oh, that's right cloud, uh, cloud rider um yeah and like stuff like that had like a real like epic spaghetti western time. I just remember him being like, "No, I'm, he's like not a ton." He's like, "I just when you put a ton of reverb on those guitars, that's what that's what they want to hear. Or that's what they want to be played on them or something like that." <laughs> but were you are, are you really into those movies? Like into like the deep cut spaghetti westerns at all? Or? Uh, I I enjoy I enjoy them. There's I don't know. There's this channel that I get from Buffalo that 
I think it's called like <clears throat> the Grit Channel or something. Mm -hmm. And they play all sort of old spaghetti westerns and sort of lost lost movies from that generation that you know you just don't really see anymore. I do like them. I I, I mean I kind of like the classics like Hang 'em High and mm -hmm. uh you know or 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 like the Sam the, those Sam Peck and Paw movies are pretty Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those are good. I, I get really into this. It's funny because like maybe it's because like the Sergio Leone, a fistful of dollars, good, the bad, and the ugly. I've seen so much that I don't ever even think to watch them. So when I go to watch one, I watch like the B ones, like Django and Day of Anger and The Big Gun Down, and I get more into like the like fringe stuff because I guess okay, I mean like right. I said, they're, I don't think they're like better. I think I just have seen the other ones so much. But right. um, well, I mean, I, I guess that's the same thing with people in and music too, right? It's like even though you know, I don't know. Satisfaction is a great song. <laughs> kind of hard to, you know, you, you want to get scratch, scratch deeper beneath the surface of those. But then, you know, you actually, like, if you watched one of those, you know, like, like the good, the bad, the ugly, you kind got into it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, this is really friggin' good. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm saying satisfaction because I listened to it the other day and I was like, mm -hmm. like, you know, it came on and I was like, do I really need to hear this anymore ever again? Like, <laughs> yeah. I've heard it like a billion it's times. Really and then you actually listen to it and you're like, holy shit, this is so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm definitely like that with movies. Cause like, I'll just like grow up with them. Um, man, my, one of my early, the first questions I always ask people when we do the show is, do you remember like their first experience going out with your family or whatever to seeing a movie? And I, I definitely do. Yeah. Uh, what was that? When, I, when I was really young, <laughs> Uh, we lived in um, in Denver, and there was a, a drive-in sort of in our subdivision or whatever. And uh, I remember we went to see a double feature. I didn't watch both of them. I fell asleep in the back of the car. But um, it was, uh, oh, man, it was like a, a man called Horse. And... Uh, um, I'm just blanking on what the other one was, but I definitely remember that as like my first, you know, movie memory. I don't, I can't place what a man called horse is. I don't, I don't think I know what that is. What is that? Um, I think it's, uh, maybe, uh, I'm kind of blanking on his name. He was also, I think in, uh, <laughs> who was the captain in, Sh in Jaws? Oh man, we went through this last week. Is it Roy Schreider? Uh, Roy Schreider or no, Roy, Sh Roy Schreider was the was, was he was the sheriff or the you know oh. the cop? So it wasn't like a, so it wasn't like a kids movie. Definitely not a kids movie. No. Oh okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah because my first one. Um, no, Richard, yeah, my Richard first Harris. One. It was Richard Harris. Oh, but, okay. Yeah, oh okay. Not um, not, uh, not. I don't think that's who who was in Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> that's funny yeah yeah i always like because i always think back on like those very first times how magical it was when you first go to movies like it's just because you've never been in a theater and you're like a little kid and uh it's funny that's what this is where i get the age difference because i'll have younger people on and like one guy said it was jurassic park and i was like holy cow because i remember being mm -hmm. like you know i was like 15 or 16 when that came out and he was like seven um, i remember going to see that at the the, I think it was called the Siegfried Theater in New York, and I was really excited because I'd, I'd read the book, and the book was amazing. And uh, I thought, like, this is just going to be the best movie ever. And I'm, it's at the Siegfried, which is like this huge theater in New York. And uh, I think it's called the Siegfried. Maybe it's probably called the Siegfield. I don't know. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I was I was pretty I was pretty disappointed. <laughs> I didn't think Jurassic Park was great, but I, I since watched it with my son, and and I I thought it was pretty fun. But how old's your son now? He's nine. Oh man, my um my older son is twelve, and uh -huh. we start watching a movie every we watch a movie every Friday. And I've talked about this on the show, but I kept building up RoboCop and making it like Forbidden Fruit. Like I don't know if you're old enough to see this one yet. It's pretty bad. It's pretty rough. And then the week I finally was going to let him show it, it was playing at one of our like retro houses here in Atlanta. So I got to take him to the theater and it's seriously probably one of the like 
specialist uh, theater experience in my life getting to watch because I've never seen it in theater. Robocop's my favorite action movie, and I'd never seen it in theater, so I got to watch it with him with a crowd, and yeah, it was pretty special. That kind of stuff's cool. Yeah, we, I waited till he was like 11 or 12, and I started showing him like Terminator and Evil Dead and all that stuff, and he's loving it. Um, isn't, isn't Robocop the same actor who stars in that a movie that we discussed just briefly? Yeah, yeah. A Walker, right? Oh, it's, wait, no, that isn't Walker Ed Harris. Who's Robocop? It's uh, Peter Weller. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's they right, look right. similar, though. Yeah, they do. okay. Um, well, thank. Thanks for yeah, giving me that. I, I, I wanted to do that one because I like Alex Cox quite a bit, but it, I couldn't track it down. Um, but uh, you want to introduce your movie that you picked for for me to watch? Yes, I, I picked a, I picked a movie called uh, Downtown Eighty <clears> One. <throat> there it is. Hey, look there. There's a, there's a picture of it, and uh, yeah, I. Uh, <clears throat> it's a special movie for me because when it was when it takes place was sort of the first time I ever went to New York. I don't, and I mean, like just to think like I, I went there when I was probably 15 or something or, you know, 14 or 15. And to think that like this was happening parallel to my, you know, like this world of the East <clears throat> village was happening as I was, you know, going to uh, Shea stadium with my dad and, <laughs> you know, going yeah. to musicals in Times Square. And I, I just was a little too young to to have caught that. But uh, that era of music and art and the downtown scene in New York is a really special, holds a very special place in my life. And, and watching this movie just makes me feel like I can kind of live in, live in it a little bit. Yeah, we actually, I had Dexter Romweber on earlier this week. You know Dexter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you guys have covered Lonely Guy um, yeah, right. by him. Guy, he's so good. He's one of my favorite artists. Yeah. But we were, yeah, we were talking about that because, like, you know, film's like the closest thing to time travel we get. <laughs> you know? Right, yeah, like, yeah. You, you go back and you watch like anything like the fifties movies to like silent movies, the strike and, and you're going up to the sixties. And like, it's really, it's really like this little like snapshot of the world. Even if it's like, even if it's like a science fiction movie, it's still like their take on that, you know, whatever 19, like 64's version of a science fiction movie or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I had never seen this. I honestly hadn't heard of this movie. Um, it's from a first time director and I don't, I lost his name. I had it written down. Um, it was like the only movie he directed. And what I learned today was uh, it was shot in 1980 and 81. And then I guess they couldn't finish shit because of financing. And um, they completed it in 2000 and released it, but they had lost That's all right, the yeah. original. They lost all the original audio um, except for the bands. Cause they recorded that on a multi recorder, but all the individual dialogue yeah. tracks lost. Cause I noticed when I started watching about 20 minutes in, I was like, Oh, this feels like an, like an old Italian movie or something. Everybody's, everybody's dubbed. I can <laughs> tell everybody was dubbed. And um, man, the amazing Sal Williams does the voice for um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, which was like a perfect yeah. choice. He's like yeah. a guy who, I, man, I love. Everything I connected. That... Go, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, you oh, I was just saying everything connected to Basquiat in the film world. I love because I love Sal Williams. And then Jeffrey Wright played him. Who's like, you know, in the nineties, who I think is just one of the, like the great. And um, anyway, yeah. So my, my connection to Basquiat and film has always been a, a pleasant one. I think the the, the director was uh, Ido Bertoglio. Yeah, I don't know who that is. Yeah, that's that's his. Uh, I, I don't know what else he did either. But yeah, it said he didn't direct any other movies. Yeah, it reminded me a lot of um, early Gus Van Zandt. And, oh, yeah. um, and of course, like early Jarmusch, like, I don't know, just the, the way the dialogue was, you know, reminded me of, um, yeah, my own private Idaho and some of that early stuff. And then of course, Jarmusch. But I mean, this is like around the same time that Jarmusch is getting started. So I, it's like who influenced who, you know, um, I think it's just that certain cities have that energy. Like New York just has like the New York in independent scene from like 78 to 86 all kind of has this like 
a lot of those movies. I think like Taylor Mead and like um, a lot of those guys. Yeah, that has like a similar feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I I went to New York probably. I went by myself probably about uh, three or four years after um, that that period I was talking about taking a trip with my with my dad as a as a high school student and uh then i i really explored that area and i got to go to dance tyria and uh you know king tut's wawa and all these bars that and, and nightclubs where bands in this movie are playing and uh it, watching this movie just takes me right back to that like it, as being feeling like there's a sense of real danger about it and a an excitement and like a, a newness even it's kind of sort of post-punk i guess right like 81 it's a little you know yeah it's uh, but, i guess it's part of that I, I guess it'd be part of the no wave movement or something like dna are in it and um um who else um it's got like um i, I don't oh, know if got, Vincent... james chance is in it uh oh yeah from kid the creole. contortions yeah kid creole um debbie uh, harry has a an actual part in it, but there's like musical performances by DNA and a couple the bands. Plastics. The plastics, yeah. yeah. The DNA one I thought was really great. It was cool to see them. Um, it really is, yeah. But that, but that's you know, you mentioned Kid Kid Creole like that. That footage of them is epic. I mean, that is just like epic. that was really good. Yeah, yeah. and I I remember like what you know I used to watch Saturday Night Live back then and seeing them on set and back then i would you know whatever was on saturday night live the next day i would just run out to the record store and buy whatever it was <laughs> well that thing <laughs> yeah. of the day when snl would have like beef art on and like it was like very exciting oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to sound like an old fart but now it's just like you know whatever ariana grande whoever sells records but it used to be like um a really exciting thing it with was the band. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been the, the the cast being like so in tune with that downtown scene and you know they they would have probably have the ear of a musical director and be like you know hey you, you should put flipper on yeah <laughs> which is pretty spectacular yeah i miss i miss seeing a lot of those like that kind of energy on television it doesn't really there's not really a place for that on regular television anymore which is like weird even like late night i mean you got you guys did conan before i think right yeah with with nico yeah yeah and i mean like even like i'm not trying to sound cynical but even like i don't know like the current lineup of late night shows i don't feel like there's like a good home for music like there used to be but you know whatever we have the internet and everybody can watch everything all the time so it's, it's it, all yeah, I mean, it all worked out <laughs> yeah, I think um I was going down like a clash rabbit hole the other night on the internet and i was like like when I when I was like sixteen, if this existed, like what what would my life be? I would never leave home. I would just watch Clash videos, which I do now. But uh, yeah, you know, it's I used to I, buy used to be like, like the comp thing. sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just I used to buy like these compilation VHS tapes off of eBay, and it would be like Tom Waits like talk show performances, nineteen seventy eight to eighty five, and I would just like. It would have commercials still in it and be all edited by some guy with two VCRs and it would right. like have him on Letterman. I get every Letterman for it. And I would sit home on a Friday night and just like watch it un you know uninterrupted. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean um I used to scour like the pages of magazines like Trouser Press and just looking for any little tidbit of a you know a a British punk band or a photo or a, <laughs> <laughs> so just I, I i was living in halifax nova scotia at the time so there was no like there was like kind of in the middle of nowhere and that's was the only way to get anything was you know some one dude would have a copy of a magazine and we'd all like look at it and yeah <laughs> there was something like kind of like fun with film i was more of a film guy like i had um um, I had pretty good access to music collections through my sisters, but like when I started getting to film, I always talk about how like the first time I saw a racer head, it had like Japanese subtitles and it was like a copy of a copy of a, of a video. Right, right. And, and it was like, you know, it wasn't blocked. Right. And like, it was just weird. And a lot of movies, like I remember, um, how 
exciting and it would make you kind of like it more because i remember the first time i saw alejandro hodorowski's movies uh, like holy mountain and el topo yeah. i liked them just because it was like it was like tracking down the holy grail and i finally got it and popped it in and i'm like well i right, better right. like this and yeah. now like when i watch those movies i'm like eh, you know <laughs> like now, that, now that I can watch them on YouTube, I'm like, this really right. isn't that great. Like some of them I like, don't get me wrong. Speaking of music, some I didn't write a lot of notes for this. Um, I did enjoy the movie. Yeah, it was really good. I loved it. Um, like I said, seeing Basquiat act was cool because I don't, I don't, I don't. He's I'm not like a aficionado with him at all. Um, but it's always there's a John a piece of John Lurie's music really early on from yeah. like a lounge workers record. I think yeah. it might be from uh, Voices at Chunk. And it's always strange in a movie when like a song that you've heard a million times pops in and it's like, it's like seeing your teacher at the grocery I, store or something. Yeah, yeah, it like, yeah. triggers, it yeah. triggers this thing. You're like, wait, 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 yeah. this isn't where I normally, this isn't where I normally hear this. I normally <laughs> hear this in my car. And yeah, um, yeah. I thought yeah. that was cool. And there's live, um, I don't, there's live performance of the lounge lizards too, right? Isn't there? I no, I don't think so. He he walks by and he's oh, like, hey, hey he's, that's right. He makes a he has like a cam, but yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, so I remember hearing the music and then yeah, I knew I knew he was in it at one point. Yeah, he walks by and he's just like, hey, you got to catch us down at the rabbit hole tonight or something, you right. know, like whatever club, right. and yeah. like that, and he like bumps him on the arm or something, which was cool. Uh, I like the music in general. I can't figure out. I imagine Vincent Gallo did the music in the year two thousand because uh, he did he did the additional score and. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know that he would have, I mean, he could have done it back then, I guess. I mean, he was like, he, he was in, I mean, he was in the band, right? Like he was, he performed with Basquiat, right? Like they. Oh, Gallo did? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess yeah. so. I don't like, he's a dude, man. Vincent Gallo. I had a weird, I didn't get into him through Buffalo 66. I saw this like little movie he was in called Palookaville in like 95 or 96. I went with my sister. Mm -hmm. And I was like, who is that dude? That dude's crazy looking and he's awesome. Yeah. And then the then Abel Ferreira's The Funeral came out like, a couple of years later and I saw a movie. Um, I don't remember. I saw like several movies he was in. I really liked. And then um, and then I've kind of lost interest in him over the years because he's just like, you know, he's kind of he's such a like he's, he's like John Lydon or something. Just a big personality that's a bit right, much right. for me. But yeah. uh, kind of getting off track. I kind of only know him from Buffalo 66 and then just his, you know, hearing reputation about him. You know. <laughs> but but I did like that movie, Buffalo 66. I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was great, too. I, um, there's some issues I have overall with, like, just the theme of it being about, like, um, you know, this young, beautiful woman who happens to fall in love with him after he kissed. It's very male fantasy-driven, right. you know? like, But it's, like, well-made, and it's funny, and, like, I mean, he's aware of that. It's not like he tries to like hide that. But also, there's some there's great music from like um, in your movie that we that we're talking about, Downtown Eighty One. Fab Five Freddy's in it, which was awesome. And like, it was just so yeah. It was so like that's why it reminded me of Drummers because it was so like encompassing with like um, not just the rock and no wave scene, but it had like hip hop, and that was like you know pretty early in hip hop. So I thought it was really great. What was like Definitely, um. Yeah. Did, did you did you tell me how you came across it? Like, how did you come across this movie? Did you just see it when it came out, or I didn't see it when it came out. No, but uh, a friend of mine, uh, his he um, distributes it in Canada. I guess probably just Canada oh. um, films called Films We Like, and he just when I first moved to Toronto, um, laid a bunch of dvds on me and i watched it then and then uh you know really really dug it really loved watching it and uh and uh then because i had this i had to sort of really lay low for a little while rehabbing this wrist surgery so i mm -hmm. would just do like you know watch a couple movies a day and um i noticed that it was on one of the platforms so i was like Cause you know, I, I can't, I don't know where I would have put that DVD. It's somewhere. I didn't throw it out. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then there, so there it was. And I was like, Oh man, I love this movie. I got to check it out again. So, so I was just sort of refreshed by it maybe like a month ago, basically. I, I, hadn't, oh, cool. I hadn't watched it and, 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 but I always think about it and I always think about it when I hear like, you know, not that I hear them a lot, but like kid, kid Creole or, 
mm-hmm. you know, DNA or something. And then, I don't know, just like you, you mentioning uh, the Fab Freddy stuff. And uh, yeah, there was something, I forget exactly what the reference was. I think I was listening to an interview or watching a movie that he was talking about like his uncle playing him some when he was a kid like some uh jazz album and i forget who who the actual but it was like maybe like art blakely on drums and it was like some some famous very uh quintessential jazz album that was f- recorded live at massey hall in toronto so mm-hmm. I, I i keep meaning to track it down and uh so it was just cool to see him again and you know back to it to the clash like how influenced they were by that early hip hop and funk scene that was going on in new yeah. york uh you know they have that that whole like radio clash and overpowered by funk song and yeah it's just always been like a a cool uh cool reference point in music in rock music that i think gets gets forgotten about a lot is is that you know, people who were really, that, that was like an in, integrated part of the downtown New York punk scene was like yeah. also this this hip hop element as well. Yeah, I think like, yeah, hip hop's I think so important to culture and like, I love it, I still love it. My son, that's like all he's into right now is like run the jewels and um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's pretty awesome because I, I love it too. Uh, we didn't really explain the plot of this when we introduced it, but I mean, there's not, there's not really a plot per se. It's just, it's kind of like we said. It's sort of just a snapshot of New York, and I yeah. mean, he was he was homeless at the time, so it's kind of just yeah. like Basquiat in 8081. I mean, like him going around trying to sell paintings, and um, I guess oh, Chris I, Stein. Yeah, go ahead. I just I just have to interrupt because if I don't say it now, I'll forget. <laughs> no, go for it. Uh, uh, it was the you know the uh, the uh, Fab Five Freddy reference that i was talking about that i had heard an interview it was in a movie called boom for real oh yeah yeah i haven't seen yeah. that but i know what you're talking about. which is sarah sarah driver i think directed sarah driver, yeah. jim jim jarmusch's uh partner and uh mm-hmm. um and uh yeah so i was sort of in this you know basquiat kind of because that that movie's all about his, him and his you know it's an actual documentary of his his life and his early days in the, in the downtown New York scene, which, uh, you know, before he got super famous, super That's discovered. Cool, yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I, I don't know that I've seen Sarah drive. I feel like I saw one Sarah driver film and I can't think of what it is. It's, um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, speaking of that, um, how, uh, did you know ahead of time that, you, that the Sadie's would be referenced in the last Jim Jarmusch movie that dead don't die? Or did you guys find out when it came out? Uh, yeah. No, I think I think we knew. Yeah, we knew. I think we knew. Yeah. Do you guys know him? Or uh, yeah, yeah. Did... Like I mean, you know. Okay. Um, actually, this uh, guy I was talking about who laid those DVDs on me when I first moved to Toronto. He's he's quite good friends with him. Um, That's cool. And. Uh, but yeah, I think you know he's come to some shows, and um, uh, we um, we performed at his um, sort of. At, I guess it's like you know during like the film festivals after the debut, they'll there'll be a party, and we performed at mm-hmm. um, the one for I believe it was called the Dead Dead Don't Die. Was that? It? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the one that yeah. made a reference to you guys. Yeah, it's a really great. My wife and oh, I looked at each other, and, and it wasn't no, it was only lovers left alive. Sorry. So, oh, are you guys referencing that one too? We're not. No, but we played the. Uh, oh, okay. the that's the only yeah. one I haven't seen. I haven't. I okay. honestly didn't care for that one much. I watched the first like forty-five minutes, and I love him. I mean, I've loved like everything he's done. Patterson, mm-hmm. I think, is like one of the yeah. best modern films, and I mean, I I love. That's the only one I have any issue with, and I need to finish it. But um, yeah, I just remember my wife and I went to go see Dead Don't Die, and we like, oh, because they were referenced you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was really cool. Um, <laughs> so, well, yeah, I guess so we, we probably need- we have gotten to meet him and uh, hang out, and uh, yeah, he's 
seems like a great guy. He's like the dude that like if I could pick like a f- director to like hang out with, I feel like he'd be really nice and like he just seems very like he cares so much about art and like other people. Whereas I think if you met certain directors, they'd want to talk about themselves all the time. But I think mm-hmm. he'd be like a good conversationalist, and he seems like a great dude. Um, he, he is, yeah. He, he, I, I get that vibe from him for sure. So moving, on, we're gonna move to my pick. I I, I suggested to you. That um, you watch Entertainment by Rick Alverson, um, mm-hmm. and um, it kind of ties in with this movie because, like, your movie that you picked for me, some of it is about performing and just like the uh, ins and outs of like being in a touring band. There's that whole scene where the one guy is just talking about you practice this many hours and you drive this many hours and you play for 45 minutes and then. You're lucky if you leave with 70 bucks or whatever. And um, so, so entertainment, um, I think you're familiar with Neil Hamburger. Um, yeah. This is, a, this is a film that is based on a, a, um, a stage persona of Greg Turkington. And um, I get, is this your first film by Rick Alverson that you've seen? I believe it is. Yes. Yeah. All right. I'm anxious to hear what you think about it, but I, I will say, um, you know, I'm a big film. Like, I'm the biggest film geek in the world, and I, I, I I'm always thinking the ne- the best next thing is around the corner. I'm not one of those people that lives in the past and thinks that nothing's ever going to surpass. Okay, well that's Cassavetti. cool. Yeah, I mean, I love Cassavetes, I love Fellini, but yeah. I don't think that like I think the best is yet to come. I think there's always great guys, and as far as American cinema right now, there's some um, a couple ladies that I think are doing great work, and then this man, I think Rick Alverson. Is doing really interesting work. It's like some of the most confrontational movies I've ever seen. He directed a movie called The Comedy with Tim Heidecker that's not funny at all. And it's like really mm-hmm. strange and dark. It's got a similar tone to this. Um, I picked this one for you uh, because it, you've been touring for a few years. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's sort of a nightmarish look of the ins and outs of a touring um, of, a, of a nightclub comic and his on his tour and um that's that's really all i can say about the plot of it because again we're, we didn't really pick plot heavy movies but yeah i'm no. anxious to hear what you thought, thought well, about it one thing i i did uh observe is that they're they're both kind of like these uh i guess you would call it like a pic- picaresque like they're both you know because because in in downtown 81 uh basket sort of starts uptown and walks down to you know it's all about this sort of journey right and and mm-hmm. in in uh entertainment the neil hamburger character he's also on a journey and it's just like you know town after town whereas you know basket's kind of neighborhood and encounter after encounter and um i had no idea what to this movie like i i i knew like i mentioned to you that i i knew who neil hamburger was but really just from you know like sort of like you were talking about getting like a dvd like when when he first started getting known it was very underground and i had heard about him and you know maybe got like a dvd of some of his set somewhere and you know i i actually always kind of everyone was like oh dude this guy's so not funny and i was like i actually kind of find this funny like i (laughs) i kind of like it and the movie opens up with him performing and telling a couple of jokes and I'm laughing. In a that, that was probably the only time I laughed in this movie. Like it got, yeah, it's not funny. <laughs> yeah. It got so heavy and dark and like, it's just, it's really like this descent and demise of, of uh, an entertainer, like a, a, a guy who's just, and he, you know, there's funny people in the movie, like John C. Riley is a funny guy, you know, like well, Michael but, Sarah. Yeah, Michael Sarah also a funny guy, and and like that's probably the most um like hard to watch part is with Michael Sarah. Like it's very it's like you're very, very uncomfortable. Awkward. Yeah. Did you yeah. like the movie overall, and like, what did you think of? It? Well, I I did. I did like it. I like most movies that I watch. I'm not. <laughs> I'm like that I'm, too. <laughs> I I just am. Like I just I like being checking out and going into that world, whatever world it is. Like a movie has to be pretty terrible for me to not like it. I'm not saying that I thought this was 
like, not, <laughs> yeah, I you know, like was kind of terrible. Like I didn't think it was kind of terrible. I, I enjoyed it and it really, it actually affected me. And um, I don't know how, like how much detail you go into on the podcast. I don't want to ruin the movie for somebody who might want to watch it, but like the, the, the peak of his demise is at that party when he just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so disturbing and it really <laughs> left like, it left like this. I was, I was shake I was shaken by it because I was expecting it to be funny. And then all of a sudden I was like, okay, here's John C. Riley. Now, now it's going to, you know, he'll bring some levity to this, <laughs> this darkness. And it just kept, he was he was such a character that I know from touring where you're like this guy, like, I don't know, it was his cousin in this particular case, but let's say it's like this guy who you went to high school with and they're like, hey, I really want, you know, you guys are really good. You know, you should talk more in, in between songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, you just don't get it. <laughs> and, so you know, funny. yeah. Yeah, so, I would yeah. say like my relatives either think I have a garage band or that I'm like a superstar. Like depending on which relative you talk to, yes, when right. it, like, certain, certain ones I see, they're like, "Oh my gosh, Jeffrey's he's played nightclubs all over the world. He's got hundreds of people." I'm like, I'm looking at my like, hundreds, like they just love him. He'll sign autographs and like I do. Um, <laughs> and then other ones are like, "How's your little thing doing? When your little uh, right. but, do, 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 do. <laughs> how's that going?" You know, and I'm like. They're like, don't worry, it'll pick up, you know. So it's like nobody really gets yeah. what you, you know. Yeah. You have those people in your life, but yeah, I um, he's kind of the king of doing this, where he gets, like I said, really funny people. His new movie, a uh, newest movie, it's called The Mountain, and it has Jeff Goldblum and Ty Sheridan again, and it's about the first lobotomist, and it's it's really it's pretty heavy too. And um, this one is like probably my favorite of his, just because I, I do love Greg Turkington slash Neil Hamburger. I think he's mm. really, really just funny character. And like the, I, I don't know if you've met him before. Um, he's like a dude I've met several times, and he's just like oh, the nicest boy, guy. Never... Mm -hmm. He just plays here a lot, so I've met him at, at clubs and stuff. And he's just he's super sweet, and then he's so mean on stage. It's funny. Right. Um, okay, so yeah. you know that the the part where he. He really, um, he really goes after that uh, woman. It's towards the end of the movie, and then yeah, when she like throws the glass at him. So is that think, like sort of par for the course in one of his shows? Well, by the time I started going to see him, he'd been around for like six years, and everybody seems in on the joke now. Um, right. Like I, 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 I've seen people walk out and like, um, but he's usually headlining now, like at the Earl. So like. Um, I remember there was a story when like, right when, um, what was it? Was it Whitney Houston that died? Um, he was opening for Todd Berry and he cleared the room until he was done. Cause he just like would not let up on like Whitney Houston jokes. So I, I think he can still clear a room. Right. Um, some of that, I don't know the ins right. and out of that. Rick Alverson, he talks about this, but some of that was probably like, that was probably real prisoners in the beginning. Cause he has this style right. of, there's a scene in the comedy when he goes into an all black nightclub and um, he filmed it at an actual nightclub filled with mostly black patrons and took Tim Heidecker in there and was like, just like give him hell. And they, and he basically told everybody, he's like, look, this guy's going to probably offend you. Like don't really beat him up. Just like react to it and stuff. And they said it was pretty scary shooting because like he was saying like some pretty awful stuff. And, um, I, I think that's like what he enjoys. It's almost like a Borat kind of thing. I think he likes the sort of it's danger. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it's, it really, it seems to be his thing. I mean, he, even like that opening scene that you're, uh, uh, you mentioned where you're, you know, he's performing in a, in a penitentiary and uh, <clears throat> what is he like? Tells like a, like sort of a, a, a rape joke or something and i was like oh yeah my, like this is just like what i was really like <laughs> what is going on here <laughs> like yeah he like oh, just so layered with uncomfortableness <laughs> yeah and the other actor that's plays like the clown character touring around with him is ty sheridan who a lot of people know from like ready player one and a lot of like spielberg movies I think okay. he's just awesome. He was so good in it, and like, yeah, he was great. 
his his clown character is funny um yeah it's it's a this is like out of the movies we've done on this show this is probably for the non-film you know like sort of buffs on this show this is probably the most like confrontational sort of like challenging film that i've like probably recommended you know what it reminded me of is um have you ever seen robert altman's three women i haven't no but i know i can kind of get get a little taste of like the robert altman feeling yeah. where it's, it's everything's in real time and you know uh it's it feels it feels like there's there's not a ton of script and that it's just mm -hmm. you know you guys just be you going you know <laughs> <laughs> um well that film is also sort of this american nightmare it takes place in like um like in all these like deserts and stuff i don't know they just they they, they sort of to me feel like cousin film. another film um at the end of the show we're getting towards the end here i think uh i'm watching the timer i'm, I'm learning how to do this show oh, i have okay, no idea okay. what I'm, doing. I'm a nightclub musician i don't really know how to host shows and stuff but um I uh, we do our we're gonna recommend some films and this wasn't on my list but when you start talking I, I was gonna recommend this movie have you ever seen this um movie with Burt um, Lancaster called The Swimmer Oh yeah uh, so I love that movie when you were talking about how it's like an odyssey of like you know town to town yeah. in 80, yeah. 81 is like person to person Swimmer for you guys that don't know it's it's based on Achiever uh, uh I don't know what's his name Richard uh, Who's the author? It's based on Achiever. Am I saying sure. it right? Yeah, that's it. It's based on one of his short stories. And it's basically this um, swimmer who decides he's going to hit every swimming pool on the way back to his house. And the character starts out one way and has conversations. And by the time you get to the last house, you've basically done 180 degree. Yeah. You know, your your opinion on the man has changed so much. And it's um, it's it's a fascinating movie. It's so good. That wasn't my recommendation. But when we started talking um yeah yeah i can see uh, yeah the same same sort of like that that following a journey but that you know you're just going place to place and yeah it's a it's another good one um i um so our movies came out in 2000 because the, the movie we talked about for you i think we said this it was made in 80 and 81 but it was released in 2000 yeah do you know what yeah. do you know what the uh number one highest grossing movie was that year in 2000 yeah uh the no, quiz, I no but what it was, was mission it? impossible it was mission impossible 2 wow and then gladiator and then wow. the uh entertainment came out in 2015 do you know those do you have any guesses in 2015 what the biggest movie uh no they're both no, franchise don't. movies oh okay uh <laughs> uh i don't know so, was there a star wars that came out in 2015 yeah man it was it was the Jurassic World and then Star Wars Force Awakens. Those were the top two. Okay. I have, um, I, I keep, um, since I've gotten older, I keep a list of every movie I watch now because um, I, I sometimes have to cross check if I've seen or anything. And I have, um, my two favorite movies from those years are um, in 2000, Woody Allen, just a great guy that Woody Allen, everybody loves him. But Small Time <laughs> Crooks came out. And then uh, this movie called Songs from the Second Room. And then 2015 was when um, Mad Max Fury Road came out. Mm -hmm. And this animated movie by um, Charlie Kaufman called Anomalisa. So those are my those are my favorites. But um, I want you to end the show, so I'll let you talk about your your recommend. The, the movie I recommended is uh, Renee. You got the image for this one. It's called The Linguini Incident. I was wondering if you've oh. ever seen that. Yeah. I feel like I did see that. Yeah. So, okay. So this, this is available on YouTube. Other than that, good luck finding this. This is this like 1992 kind of almost like, I don't know. It's this comedy, almost like fish called Wanda kind of humor. It's like really goofball. And it's David Bowie and Rosanna Arquette. And he's trying to get his green card. And he's trying to like trick somebody at the bar he works in at to like marry him or something like that. It's been a it's been about a year since I've seen it, but anyway, it's really goofy. A lot of people hate it. It has a pretty low rating <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. But if you guys feel like watching something silly with David Bowie, that's my recommendation. And uh, yeah, so yeah, thanks for coming on the show, man. And like, yeah, if you want to do your do, do your film recommendation and okay. anything you want to say, I, I just want to 
add before we before we go to my recommendation did, have you seen the man who fell to earth no i still haven't seen that i'm sorry okay have you read the book no oh okay. I'm terrible I, I, i'm not I like a guy and then saw the movie sort of like back to back and i think you kind of need to read the book i was going to say like if you do like david bowie okay. movies, you know read the but if you don't like reading it might be tough because it's Books no, I do. Care. I do. I just um, I'm not big on sci-fi in general. Oh, but, really? Um, yeah, I'm kind of. Uh, I just like people talking. My son the other day was like, "What are all those black and white French movies you watch?" I was like, "Yeah, it's just people talking about crap." That's what I like. But um, yeah. So your uh, your def your, your recommendation is a black and white movie with just a bunch of people talking. It is. Yes, it's, it's called uh, "Permanent Vacation" by Jar our the guy we've been talking about, Jarmusch. Uh, Jim Jarmusch. It's uh, also takes place in New York. It's kind of uh, it's kind of vague. Like a few th things about it. Like there's uh, the scene where he the 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 lead and and again I don't think the actor who plays the main character ever really acted in anything else afterwards. Or I couldn't find anything. Um, it was it was Jarmusch's first feature, right? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's great. It's just like like bomb, like burnt out downtown New York City, and then there's this scene where he, this guy like he comes across like this this veteran. Do you, have you seen it? Do you know the, what I'm that scene? I'm yeah, talking it's about? been a long time, like probably like yeah. fifteen years, um, and, and maybe like, longer. Seems to be like a veteran who has like some kind of maybe shell shock from a, a war or something and i'm like was he supposed to be like a vietnam veteran you know like it's just kind of i don't know i, I really w was was into you know reading tons of books about that era and um so yeah just i've, I've just always been curious about it i saw i saw it ages ago as well so I, i'm i'm you know i just when you when you were saying think about a movie that might tie in with with what you know the movies we've been talking about tonight i thought mm -hmm. that would be a good another nice kind of journey through that era downtown new york yeah it's um his early movies are kind of all about like foreigners it's about that hungarian woman they're always like they're almost oh, always yeah, like one in paradise oh is that stranger in paradise yeah I think Stranger Oh man, Murder. I think I'm mixing them up. I don't think I've seen Permanent Vacation. Shoot. Oh, okay. No, I haven't seen that. If I, yeah. if, uh, maybe, I feel like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm mixing them up. I might have seen it, but I'm thinking of Stranger in Paradise this whole okay. time. Stranger, yeah, right. Stranger in Paradise was, was also great. And, and a movie that, like, I knew nothing going into watching it. I, I, I went to see one movie and it was sold out and it was at, like, a multiplex. And so I just was like, all right, I guess I'll go see Stranger in Paradise. And then, boom like you know life changing and, and probably good that i sometimes it's good to not know anything about it. like i don't i don't you're you're a real um movie buff like do you like watching the extras and like how did they do it and how did they make this shot like because for me i'd like to just be lost in it and to be blown away by the magic of movie making in general, there's certain movies I don't really like behind the scenes, but sometimes I will like watch a commentary if it's like what I really like is when like a film ex when it's not the director, when it's like an old like uh, Fellini or Godard, and then they have like a film expert come on and they kind of talk about it because it's like um, it's they're not in it, you know, you know, they're, 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 they're not in yeah. the grim. They're like, oh, when we shot this, it was awful. It was pouring rain. She did it 60 times. It kept flicking her hair the wrong way. Like uh, that right. ruined the movie for me. But when it's like an ex, I used to love hearing like the experts on those criterion where they're just like explaining everything, you know, like all the, you know, it helped me. It, it learned to me a lot about like film theory and stuff. Um, yeah, I always talk about. Um, I had brief conversations with Roger Ebert right before he passed. Uh, we would exchange emails, and he was like so like, um, you know, important to my film knowledge growing up because I would watch a movie on my own and I wouldn't watch his review. And then this is when I'm like 16, 17. I'd go see like, you know, Oliver Stone's new movie or whoever. I start getting into all the directors and what their names were. And then I would record uh, I would record his show. And then th that week I'd watch like all the movies. 
And then I'd try to formulate my own opinion and then I'd watch it. And I remember the funniest one was Big Lebowski because I was like, man, this is like a perfect movie. It's like incredibly like nothing like the Coen brothers have done. And at first I wasn't like nuts about it. And I actually saw it twice in the same week. And now the Big Lebowski is like this cult movie. And I remember Roger Ebert hated it. Like he was just like, I've only just like two Coen brothers movies. And then like a few years before he passed, he actually went back and was like, I changed my mind. It's a good movie. Right. Right, right. he's like I've gotten so many letters about but I, I i it didn't bother me when we didn't agree you know like when but it, it's a way how i wanted to like i guess feel smart like i wanted to like have my opinion and then hear rogers and um and i got all i'd always feel really smart whenever like, like i remember when i saw jackie brown and i was like oh this is like a real step up for quentin because you know i i could see him getting a little more immature as a filmmaker but he's going like more serious and and then Roger Ebert said it was like the best movie of the year. And I felt uh, it always feels like, you know, it validates you when you're younger to hear something. Oh, like yeah, that. yeah, but, totally. Totally. I know what you mean. Uh, I'm getting off track, but that's OK. It's my show. They said I can do whatever I want. We're just on the Internet. Um, speaking of that, did you happen to see um, I'm Thinking of Ending Things? No. Uh, it's the newest Charlie Kaufman movie. No. Um, it's on Netflix. I Man, I, dude, it's like one of my it's. Probably my top five movies now. I love it so much. But there's a scene. I'm going to write it down. Cool. Yeah, man. Write that one down. Everybody should watch it. It's a Netflix movie. It's Charlie Kaufman. He's the best. But there's a scene where um, a character in it turns, like, just for no reason, sort of turns into Polly and Kale and just starts reviewing um, Woman Under the Influence. And uh, that's a movie you've seen, right? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So she just starts ripping the movie apart, and and she really did. Pauline Kael back in the day, like, did not was not a fan of that movie. I love it, and I love Pauline Kael, and I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And like you were saying about looking up about behind the scenes, I found some interviews with Charlie Kaufman, and he talked about how you know how just how he was okay with her hating, <laughs> and how he just found his take on it so interesting. And that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, I really don't. Um, you know, I like some universally hated movies. I wrote a play about, you know, a woman who's obsessed with Waterworld. Um, I just like movies in general. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, I, I, I would find that interesting because Pauline Kael's another woman who, like, her, her reviews were really interesting to me. And when she would just, like, completely disagree with me, uh, you know, I th thinking back, it probably made me feel stupid sometimes. But now I, I like reading those where, like, Blue Velvet or something, which, like, you know, most people, most film buffs just love Blue Velvet. You, it's hard to find somebody to love. But Roger Ebert notoriously, like, ripped it apart, you know. Right. Um, speaking of uh, do you have, like, an all-time favorite movie or director? Um, I know some people don't do that. I, I, just wonder I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because, like, forever my all-time favorite movie was – the Omega Man with Charles and Heston. Oh yeah, you told me that. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And I and I mean <clears throat> like actually my all time favorite movie, but the scenario and circumstances surrounding me watching it are my favorite. And so it left a huge impression. Like I remember my dad and I were driving through like through Maine and there was all of a sudden like this total whiteout. And we had to get a motel. And I mean, I'm a, I must have been like 11 or 12, probably. So probably too young to watch it. But, you know, so there we were just like two people in a motel room. And he, it was on TV. And he let me stay up and watch it. And I don't know. I, you said you don't like sci-fi. But I, I, I think that's why I like sci-fi so much. Is that movie really like got me into that whole dystopian type of uh type of scenario and uh yeah i started reading like ray bradbury right around then too, oh, cool. so. <laughs> i don't like i don't like uh it's nothing that i don't i dislike in general there's some like i have several sci-fi movies i love i like um i like the original solaris a whole lot I actually like soderbergh yeah. solar too that's my favorite like science fiction story like just the actual the original story is the russian one right yeah, it's, by Tarkovsky. Yeah. I, ju I just saw uh, that um, maybe like two months ago. I've never seen it before. Oh, cool. It's, yeah. uh, so have you seen the remake? No. 
Okay, so uh, spoiler alert. So the ending of Solaris is like one of my favorite endings ever where like he goes back home and then he walks inside and there's a glitch in the Solaris and it's yeah. raining in his house, whereas it was raining outside his house, which I think was just one of the most powerful scenes. And right. like uh, philosophically, it was so interesting. They What they did in the new one was so lame. But the movie's good, but um, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's worth watching. I think it's a good, it's short. It's like 85 minutes or something. Yeah, but um, sure. And there's also insane clown posse music in the new one, which I thought was we a weird choice. Um, but <laughs> but I still somehow enjoyed it. I think just because, I, I mean, I love that story so much. But I do mm -hmm. like some science fiction. I love um, science fiction action. Like I said, my son and I, the movies we've been watching are like Total Recall, Mad Max, mm -hmm. uh, Robocop. I just don't get too into like um, too deep of cuts and too deep into like, you know, 2001 and like um, the cerebral. I mean, I, I, some of that's okay. I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm very picky about which ones I get into. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you watch, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to blow the title here. Uh, did you watch moon? Oh no, that's David Bowie's son did that one. Uh, yes, I think he did. Yeah, it's with um, I never, never remember the name of the actor, but uh, Sam Rockwell. Sam, Sam Rockwell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, I haven't seen that. The last science fiction movie I really loved was Claire Denis' High Life. Did you see that? No. It's um, I love Claire Denis. I think she's great. One one thing I want to get into on this show is like all the great, great female directors, because like all the time people will ask me like, who are good female directors? And there's a dozen. I mean, there's so many. It's just that they haven't broken through to the Spike Lee, Spielberg, Tarantino fame, you know, but right. there's so many. Now we have Greta Gerwig and, um, did, you know, did there's you a like, lot of... Uh, um, um, Meek's Cutoff? Did you see that? What's that? Meek's Cutoff? Who's that? I can't, I just can't remember the director's name, but it's, um... Uh, oh, I just read about that the other day, yeah. Oh, man. Um, she also directed uh, a movie... Uh, oh, um, it's Kelly Kelly Reinhardt. That sounds right. Yeah, that's what um, it is. She did like Wendy and Lucy, and she did yeah, um yeah yeah, yeah yeah I love her. Um, yeah. she did that really great movie Old Joy. Oh, um, Old man, Joy, Joy. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking of. That's the one with uh, Will Oldham, right? Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's ties into movie. our movie um, Entertainment. He made a movie Will Oldham called New Jerusalem. We're just naming movies now, but what did I start to? <laughs> I don't know. I lost. I lost track. Well, so it's a movie. It's a movie show. So, yeah, we can talk about all the yeah, you know, I started to say something. Like our, not even our favorite hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just like, um, yeah, I, I, I did that old man thing where I knew where I was going, and then, then <laughs> but, um, but yeah, she's great. Kelly, <laughs> Claire Denis. I don't know. I don't know. I'm saying highlights really good. It's got it's got that boy from Twilight and Batman in it. I can Robert Pattinson, who. Mm -hmm. um, I hate saying he's from Twilight because that was like 15 years ago and he's done so much great work, but it's, um, it's about these prisoners that put on this ship and it's got Julia, but no, she's like, you know, it doesn't get much better than her. Um, it's really cool. I think you'll like it. Tinder sticks do a lot of her music. Are you, are you familiar with them? Yeah. Um, so sorry. What was that movie called? Oh, uh, high life. High life. Okay. Yeah, yeah, write it down. Everybody write it down if you want to. Um, anyway, what which probably... Uh, there was like some movie that came out, I don't know, probably like five or six years ago that was about like a... It's called like the Ice Train or Snow Train or something. Do you know what Snow Piercer. Talking? Yeah, Snow Piercer, yeah. right. Did Snowpiercer, you, think, did yeah. you see that? I still haven't watched it, no. I um, uh, Again, I, I, like... I, I thought it was okay, but... I mean, I'm just thinking of sort of sci-fi-ish things. I, I didn't... I didn't I didn't love it. Yeah, I, it's, I, it, it takes a lot for me to watch, especially new ones. Uh, the one before High Life I liked was Ex Machina. I thought that was really good. Oh, I like uh, that a lot. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, Alex Garland, cool. He just made a new movie. But, um, yeah. well, cool. Well, we're, uh, we're hitting an hour. I think we're okay. ready to okay. run. I can talk to you all night, and we can keep we can name a million movies. But, um, yeah, man, thanks so much for doing this. And, um yeah, Thanks I hope I can see you on tour. You guys haven't you guys haven't been to Atlanta in a million years. I don't go anywhere anymore. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, everybody check out the, your new record. In February or March, we'll be down your way. I hope. Cool. Oh, good. That'd be awesome. I'll be there.
All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on.